If you're drinking coffee after lunch, I have some important news to share with you. There's a groundbreaking study that just got published, and what it shows is caffeine doesn't just keep you awake. It fundamentally alters your brain electrical patterns throughout the night. And here's what at least surprised me the most. If you're under the age of 40, these neurological changes are significantly more pronounced, especially during your REM sleep. Remember, that's the sleep where emotional processing happens. Welcome back to the channel, everyone. I'm Dr. Sean Hashmi, board-certified nephrologist and obesity medicine specialist. And today, I'm going to break down the fascinating research that's changing how at least I think about my own afternoon coffee. Look, I get it. That 2 p.m. slump when it hits, coffee seems like the perfect solution. But researchers from the University of Montreal just published findings that show that even a regular cup of coffee in the afternoon increases something called brain entropy. This is basically how random or chaotic your brain signals are and pushes your brain towards something that scientists call a critical regime during sleep. More about that in a second. Now, remember, this isn't just about feeling groggy. We're talking about measurable changes in neural complexity that affect how your brain consolidates memories, repairs itself, and clears out toxins. Here's why all of this matters. Poor sleep doesn't just make you tired. It accelerates aging, weakens your immune system, and increases risk for everything from diabetes to dementia. But the good news here is, is that understanding this science gives you a clear path to better sleep. So by the end of this video, you're going to understand exactly how caffeine changes your brain's entropy and complexity during sleep. You're going to understand why your age dramatically affects these changes due to adenosine receptor density. Remember, these are your brain's sleep switches. You're going to see why the latest meta-analysis, which is essentially a study that combines results from multiple papers, it shows you need 8.8 .8 to 9 hours minimum between your last coffee and bedtime. And it's not the six hours we used to think. Let's dive into the research. Scientists at the University of Montreal, they studied 40 healthy adults using sophisticated EEG analysis, that electroencephalography, which is basically reading your brain's electrical activity through sensors that are placed on your scalp. Now, the study design was that half the participants, they got 200 milligrams of caffeine. That's about two cups of coffee. The other half, they received a placebo, and they, off, they monitored their brain activity throughout the night. Now, what they found was remarkable. Caffeinated brains showed increased entropy with effect sizes of 0.67 to 0.93. So in plain English, in the world of research, effect size greater than 0.5 is considered large. And what they found was that the brains shifted towards critical brain dynamics. And when they looked at machine learning, machine learning could distinguish caffeinated sleep with about 75% accuracy. And the most pronounced effects were seen in non-REM sleep. Remember, that's your deep restorative sleep. So now let's take a step back and learn what is this brain entropy concept? What does it actually mean? Because it's truly the key to understanding why your afternoon coffee is so problematic. So when you look at neuroscience, entropy just basically measures how unpredictable or random your brain signals are. In normal deep sleep, brain waves are like gentle ocean waves. They have low entry, predictable patterns. But with caffeine, you get these choppy, random patterns with high entry. It's kind of like trying to organize files while someone is shuffling papers. And in this particular study, the researchers use multiple entropy analysis basically looking at randomness across different time scales. And caffeinated brains look more like awake brains, even when they were in their deepest parts of sleep. And here's where the research gets really interesting. Remember, the study compared two age groups. The first age group was 20 to 27 years old, and they had a dramatically stronger caffeine response. The other age group was 41 to 58 years old, they had smaller brain changes, but before you think it's the younger folks that are more at risk, the older folks, 41 and above, 
they actually had far greater sleep disruption. So when you're looking at the younger group, they had the strongest changes during REM sleep. That's the rapid eye movement sleep. That's where you dream, process emotions, consolidate emotional memories. But the reason that the older folk actually have greater issue is because of the adenosine A1 receptor density. So let me explain a little bit of the science behind it. Adenosine is the chemical that builds up during the day and it makes you sleepy as the day comes to an end. And adenosine receptors, think of them like parking spots where the sleepiness chemical, adenosine, attaches. As we age, we lose these parking spots. In other words, the receptor density of adenosine receptors declines. And so the way caffeine works is it blocks these receptors. So it, it takes up the parking spots so sleepiness can't attach. And if you already have less receptors, it's much easier for caffeine to be able to block those. Research by Nelhick confirms that caffeine metabolism, it doesn't actually change with age. So the half-life of caffeine is still about two and a half to four and a half hours, whether you're 25 or you're 55. But the receptor numbers decline significantly. So in other words, the age paradox is that younger brains, they have more receptors, and so there are stronger neurological changes. But older brains have fewer receptors, but they have far more fragile sleep architecture. And so essentially what that means is that people over the age of 40, they wake easier and they struggle to return to deep sleep. So caffeine has a much greater impact on them. So if you've been watching so far, the question becomes is when should you drop or stop drinking caffeine? So we want to look at the research, not somebody's opinion. There's a 2023 meta-analysis. Gardner and colleagues, they analyzed thousands of participants across multiple studies. And what they found was that caffeine consumed 8.8 .8 hours before bed still reduce sleep quality. And so this goes against the old six hour rule from 2013 that said you should stop drinking six hours before going to bed. So the key takeaway here is really about your caffeine cutoff times. If you're under the age of 40 and you go to bed, let's say at 10 p.m., which you should, stop drinking caffeinated products by 1 p.m. If it's 11 p.m., your bedtime, stop by 2 p.m. This is the minimum. So the nine hour rule is your minimum. If you're over the age of 40, make it simple. Stop by noon, by 12 p.m., regardless of your bedtime, and stop by 10 to 11 a.m. if you're sensitive. Your sleep is so crucial and it is so fragile as we get older that you have to actively pro protect it. Now, sleep considerations. There are folks that are considered slow metabolizers. So 40% of the people out there, they have a CYP1A2 gene variant. And essentially, they need 12 plus hours from caffeine intake to when they go to bed to be able to have sleep efficiency that's optimal. Remember, sleep efficiency is the percentage of time in bed you're actually sleeping. And caffeine reduces this. And so the optimal sleep architecture across all ages, minimum nine to 10 hours of caffeine free. Minimum, not maximum. And if you're older, go less than that. Now, coming back to the study at hand today, Let's put the study's 200 milligram dose in perspective so you understand. You know, caffeine reality check is so critical because most of us don't really realize the study dose in this study was 200 milligrams and that caused all these brain changes. But if you look at your coffee at home, in an eight ounce cup, there's about roughly 95 to 200 milligrams. If you go to Starbucks and get a grande coffee, that's 310 milligrams. A Starbucks Venti is about 415 milligrams. Monster Energy is about 160 milligrams per can. Black tea is 40 to 70 milligrams. And dark chocolate, yes, chocolate. Dark chocolate is about 12 to 25 milligrams per ounce. And what the research shows is that there's dose-dependent effects. More caffeine, more disruption. And genetic variations matter. 
the CYP1A2 gene, it ends up creating essentially a 40-fold variation in clearance rates between people. Remember, the CYP1A2 gene, it basically provides instructions for liver enzymes that break down caffeine. And so what happens is, is folks who have this variant, they are 40% more likely to be slow metabolizers. So that 2 p.m. coffee, it actually might still be active at midnight for these folks because of the fact that they metabolize it so slowly. Now, let's dive into a little bit of the neuroscience of sleep disruptions. Let me explain why these brain entropy changes that I talked about earlier, they matter so much for your health. Remember, during normal non-REM sleep, that's 75% of your night, brain shows low complexity, high amplitude, slow waves. So these are big synchronized waves that sweep across the, the brain at about one time per second. And so this low entropy state is absolutely crucial for restoration. Now, critical sleep functions, they get disrupted by high entropy, specifically memory consolidation. Remember, your hippocampus is short-term memory center. This talks to your neocortex, which is the long-term storage. So this hippocampal neocortical dialogue transfers important memories and high entropy disrupts this conversion from short-term to long-term memory. Then there's the glymphatic system activation. This is your brain's garbage disposal system. And what happens is it opens during deep sleep to flush out metabolic waste. It removes proteins linked to Alzheimer's disease. It works 10 times more actively during sleep than while you're awake. And it requires, once again, a low entropy brain state to function. So what the, the Dolk study found was that caffeine creates a critical state which is great for waking, but it's terrible for sleeping. And there was this thing called flatten one over F spectral slopes, which is basically brain waves that are becoming chaotic versus being organized. And there were reduced long-term temporal correlations. Once again, brain regions were not coordinating. They weren't talking to each other well. If you want to put it in plain English, think of it like this. You're trying to clean your house during the party, you're moving around with supplies, but nothing's getting clean because everybody else is messing it up. And then when we talk about kidney disease, there's a very important connection here. And I want to make sure that I emphasize this because people don't talk about sleep and kidney disease effect enough. Sleep quality directly impacts kidney disease progression. Here's why. Poor sleep will increase blood pressure, which is the number one cause of kidney damage. And sleep deprivation will trigger inflammation. It will accelerate kidney scarring. So disruptive sleep hormones affect how your kidneys filter waste products. And studies show that getting less than six hours of quality sleep, the folks who do that have a faster kidney function decline. And of course, sleep apnea will make all of these things worse and double the risk of kidney disease progression. Now, I know what some of you are thinking is, but I sleep fine with evening coffee. Coffee doesn't affect me. So let me address this directly. What research shows about good sleepers is even people who say they sleep really well with coffee, they show they have reduced slow wave activity, which is that deep restorative brain waves you need are already reduced. They have delayed REM sleep onset. They have de uh, delayed and decreased cellular level sleep efficiency, their brain entropy goes up and you're not going to feel all these, but over weeks, months, years, the damage is certainly going to pass and get larger and larger. Now, keep in mind the study I discussed today, there are several limitations. It's only 40 participants. It's small. It's all healthy adults. They didn't have any sleep disorders. It's a single dose of caffeine, 200 milligrams. Of course, you would want to have more research on diverse populations. However, the findings of this study, they also align with previous studies that have been done. So there's a lot more confidence in these results. So to bring all of this home, let me summarize five key findings that change how we should think about caffeine. Number one, caffeine increases brain entropy during sleep. 
It creates chaotic wave-like activity instead of organized patterns. It disrupts memory consolidation, waste claims, cellular repair, and the effects last throughout the night. Number two is age matters, but not how you would expect. Under 40, there's stronger brain changes due to more adenosine receptors. Over 40, there's smaller changes, but worse sleep quality because of the fragile architecture. And REM sleep is most affected in younger adults, but it's the older adults that actually have all sorts of complications from it. Number three is dose makes a huge difference. Remember, the study used 200 milligrams, which is less than a Starbucks grande coffee. But many people out there are consuming two to three times this amount in afternoon drinks. And so the effects, they scale with dose. Number four, the nine-hour minimum rule is real. Meta-analysis of thousands shows that you need 8.8 .8 to nine hours minimum between your last caffeine intake and sleep. And that's not just one study, it's consensus from multiple research papers. And this updates the old six hour rule that many people talk about. And then number five is genetics creates individual differences. 40% of folks out there are slow metabolizers. They have the CYP1A2 variants and they may need 12 plus hours to clear caffeine. And this explains why coffee affects people different. So the science is remarkably clear that afternoon coffee isn't just keeping you awake, it's preventing your brain from performing its essential nightmare, nighttime functions. And for those with kidney disease or at risk for kidney disease, the sleep disruption, it directly accelerates kidney disease progression. So what's the bottom line? Here's what I want you to focus on the nine hour rule. Your simple action plan is to count back nine hours from bedtime. That's your absolute coffee cutoff. Try it for two weeks. Track how you feel, not just your sleep, but how's your energy? How's your focus? How's your memory? How's your mood? And for my kidney patients, this could be one of the most important changes you make right up there with blood pressure, blood sugar, and weight control. And if this research helped you in anywhere, open your eyes, please. Share this with someone who needs better sleep. Like to help others find this information. Please subscribe to the channel as it really helps me to continue to do this work. And I really want to, want to hear from all of you. What time do you currently have your last coffee? And now that you've seen this data, what will it be now with the nine hour rule? So drop a comment. Remember, I try to read all the comments and respond to as many as I can. And the last thing I always say is, Remember to always practice gratitude and kindness for others and for yourself by taking care of your health. With that, thank you for joining me on this journey. I'll see everyone next time.